Hey, Joey the Recovery Guy here. Today we're gonna answer a question that's on the mind of you know every addict and every parent of every addict, and that is, is addiction a choice? Hey guys, let's get started. So today we're gonna try and answer the question, is addiction a choice? This is one of the most confusing aspects of addiction. Obviously, addicts and alcoholics physically have to go to the liquor store and pick up the booze. We physically have to go to the dealer's house. We have to chop up them lines or load up them rigs. So it kind of does create the, at least the illusion that we have a choice. Now, there's two main schools of thinking about addiction. And one of them is that literally we have zero choice. And one of them is we have all the choice in the world and we just continue to use drugs despite negative consequences. So in order to help us answer this question, I've kind of uh, called upon the two more powerful models of addiction that seem to be the most popular and that most people will know about. So let me describe them first before we get into like whether we think addiction is a choice or not. And I know this is kind of a divisive issue and I know that it's very hard to treat addicts as if they don't have a choice. And you know, I kind of believe that some of us have more choice than others. Here we go, the moral model. The moral model is a older model of addiction. It was kind of more prevalent between like 1850 and 1940, if you will. And the moral model states that like you, you have 100% choice of whether you, you, you pick up or, or you buy some booze or not. Really what it states is that you are just making the conscious decision to use despite negative consequences. Drugs feel good. Alcohol feels good. And because it feels so good to us, we will pick up again and again and again, knowing the damage that it causes us, knowing the damage that it causes our families, and knowing the damage that it causes society. Essentially, if you wanna boil it down, if you're looking through a moral lens at an addict or an alcoholic, what you will think is that the addict is evil or just a bad person, or they're weak and they lacked character. All right, and now we got the disease model. So I'm gonna go over here for this. Now the disease model states that essentially you have a disease. So you guys don't have any control over it. Like you can't get mad at someone for having cancer. You can't get mad at someone for having HIV. You can't get mad at someone for having Lou Gehrig's disease. Basically, we don't have a choice in our behaviors. We are being driven by biological instincts beyond our control. We don't wanna be an addict. We desperately don't wanna use drugs anymore. We want our life to get better. But something inside of us, biological in nature, either in our bodies or our brains, is compelling us to use drugs against our will and we are essentially completely helpless in the face of that. Now, the more the the mental health field, I guess, really likes continuums and their continuums look something like this. Good, bad, good or bad. The two questions that they like to ask you is where are you on the good bad continuum and in what direction are you headed in? I don't believe that this is a uh, accurate enough way to describe what's going on here. We got the moral model and we got the disease model. Okay, the moral model is based on the presupposition that we have, boom, free will. Now I know you guys might be thinking that's a little bit ridiculous that I would actually have to point out the fact that the moral model is based on free will, but if you guys are in the sciences, especially in biology and the neurosciences, most of them don't believe in free will. They believe in its opposite, determinism. The moral model is based on the fact that we have free will. You guys do have 100% control over your actions, your thoughts, your emotions, and, and your mood, essentially. Now, the disease model is the opposite. It's based on determinism, and determinism is even a weirder doctrine. Determinism states that every single thing you guys will ever say, think, do, anything ever is entirely predictable. Um, if I had enough information about your guys' upbringing, your nutritional history, your hydration history, your hormonal balance, your physical size, your genetics, um, dating back to the genetics of your parents and how your parents were raised and their parents' parents, and basically if I had all the information from biogenesis 3.5 million years ago, billion years ago, sorry, life from non-life, I will be able to predict every single thing you guys will ever do in your life. There's nothing that you do that is under your conscious control. You are a biologically programmed robot 
that operates under a false assumption that they have free will. Now, as ridiculous as that idea sounds, determinism has really caught hold of a scientific community. And if you're in any kind of STEM field, I would say the majority of the people believe in determinism. Now, let's get real about this. Either one of these are ridiculous. We obviously can't control 100% of our behavior. And it gets even more complicated than that. Like, you know, and when someone jumps up and scares you and you have that like, ah, heightened emotional reaction. I don't know if that's really a part of my control. When I'm walking, uh, you know, through the park and there's a, a baseball flying at me and I duck, it's like, I don't have time to consciously choose. Like, do I really want to dodge out of the way of that ball? Like, maybe I could get a black eye. Maybe I could call in sick from work tomorrow and just kind of relax. Maybe I want to get hit by the ball. We don't decide those things things consciously really our body takes over our prefrontal cortex gets shuts off and we dodge the ball I don't even take credit for it my body has done it for me so and, and, and on a deeper level like I know that there's certain bacteria that live in the gut microbiome that absolutely love carbs and they need carbs to survive now they release toxins that damage the body and they can make you feel lethargic they can make you feel brain fog but ultimately those bacteria love carbohydrates now when you eat carbohydrates more and more and more, these things get fed and they start to grow and they start to multiply. And at the end of the day, these bacteria want the carbohydrates and you know, you start to crave them and you start to really crave these carbohydrates. I don't know if anybody, uh, any one of you guys at home has been in that situation where you just like, you know, you alcoholics must know this when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're just craving to slam some pop so you can go back to bed. It's like those bacteria want the carbs. Now, if they don't get them, they die. So they want to survive. So they will hijack your nervous system and you all, all of a sudden you'll just be walking around. It'll be a normal day and you go, oh, I feel like having some candy. You're like, oh, I feel like having some juice and you're going to crave carbohydrates. And then we got to ask the question, do you crave the carbohydrates or do the bacteria crave the carbohydrates? It's a very interesting question. Now, I don't believe anyone has 100% free will. I do believe in free will, but I believe it's on a spectrum. Now, what I also don't believe is if we go back over here to the disease model of addiction, that 100% of my activities are predetermined just because I was alive and I have a certain set of genetics. I do think that human beings have an element that we're able to choose. We're not mathematical equations. We're not deterministic. We're, I believe, what they call chaos. We have no predictable patterns, no repetitive patterns that are entirely 100% predictable. Are some people more predictable than others? Yeah. Is an addict probably going to go get loaded? 100%. But we are not determined like a clock what we are going to do that day. So I think that either of these models are ridiculous. It's more of you can be somewhere along this spectrum. Some people's addiction is more psychologically loaded and some people's addiction, addictions are more physically loaded. Now, another couple dialectics we need to explore when we're talking about the moral and the disease model, and I put verses up there just you know, to catch people because people debate this. I don't think it's verses. I think it's like you know, kind of either or in a combination of, of, the, of the two. What you need to study if you are going to try and fix someone uh, using a moral model from addiction is you will have to study the mind, okay? And the mind is like your beliefs, your values, um, your upbringing, all the kind of things here, parenting, school, all kind of elements of your environment. If you're gonna be studying the disease model, mainly what you're gonna be studying is the brain. Um, and here we got some, some, some neurotransmitters, we got some serotonin and some dopamine, and we got brain regions, hippocampus, anterior cingulate. I can't believe I forgot to put the amygdala on there. Major, major, major part, amygdala. Can't forget about the amygdala. So you're gonna be, if you're looking at the disease model, you're gonna be studying the brain. Now here is something to take into account. The disease model is a lot more prevalent today. It's a lot more prevalent. I find that most people, especially parents, they tend to treat their children or their spouse or the afflicted like they have choice, but in the medical community and as far as insurance companies are concerned or if you're a union member, the disease model rules the day. Now, there's a reason why the disease model has become a lot more prominent than the moral model and this is kind of regarded as an outdated model. The moral model is a metaphysical model. 
And what a me metaphysical means is it's not made of matter. It's not made of atoms. So in order for when something's metaphysical, it can't be studied directly like the brain can. You can't cut open my brain and find my belief system. You can't cut open my brain and find my values, find my upbringing. That can only be revealed to a therapist or a clinical counselor in the way of self-reporting and interrogation, therapy, you know, that kind of stuff. Maybe if you're a sponsor of step five. As far as the brain goes, you can actually measure. You can measure the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. You can quantify it and you can write papers based on that. You can see if there's a higher metabolic rate in the hippocampus. You can see if there's a higher metabolic rate in the amygdala. You can see if the amygdala has been enlarged through trauma. You can see if the hippocampus has been atrophied through trauma. You can tell if your uh, ventral tegmental area and your nucleus accumbens forming either the mesolimbic or the mesocortical highway, the dopamine highway, is more robust and active in people. You can actually study this and it's directly observable. So because of that, science needs to study it. Science does not study metaphysical claims. That's for philosophy. Now philosophy is valid. But when we're talking about measurable effects, simple cause and effect, this equals this, people can, you have to study the brain and you have to quantify it. And then more of this disease model ends up in your scientific literature. And this is now a laughing stock. This is now a joke. I do believe that deterministic models are incredibly powerful and they are incredibly powerful. But to disregard the moral model entirely is an absolute joke. You take a depressed person, here, I'll, I'll explain it this way. It all comes down to a simple question. What is addiction? Okay? Nobody knows. Nobody has any idea what addiction is. All of these environmental factors are implicated in addiction. All these physical factors are implicated in addiction. We don't actually know what it is. Some people are more morally addicted and some people are more disease loaded in their addiction. So. Here's, a, here's a, a general rule. The more moral your addiction, the more you are kind of on this side of the spectrum, the more things like psychotherapy and the steps are gonna work for you. But if you're too far over here, the steps will help you obviously and you should always do them and, and CBT and all that stuff is gonna help you. But if you're too far over here, we're talking the need for medication or some other kind of in intervention. Um, I know a guy, patient X, we'll call him, and he's actually a really good friend of mine. He's wicked. He does the steps, he prays, he meditates, he helps other people. He's a great guy. He's on a bunch of different types of medication. Maybe twice to three times a year, he goes into kind of a manic episode of his bipolar. And lots of the, sometimes it's not that bad, but one of those three times in a year, he will actually be so manic that he will go into a state of psychosis. He gets loaded in the state every time. I've never, as far as I, as long as I've known him, I've never seen him go through one of those episodes without getting loaded. So you can't say that, oh, you just didn't do the steps. Oh, you made a choice. Oh, you chose to be bipolar. You chose to go into mania. You can't say things like that. Obviously, there's biological factors, there's chemical imbalances that are completely beyond his control and beyond the control of the medical fraternity at large. We can't cure that stuff as of yet. So. Again, not a choice. But what you can choose, and, and, and we're gonna forget about this guy, what you can choose is you can set yourself up so that you're not, so you're not susceptible to your belief systems. Now, let's just say you have a belief that you are you know, ugly. And because you have this belief and because you're a drug addict and you're not taking care of yourself and you're, you know, you're closed down and you, you're, you're hiding from life essentially and you don't like to go out in public, when you do go out in public, it's scary to you. And what's gonna happen is you're going to, your hormones are gonna be all out of whack, you're not going to be physically fit, and you're probably, if you're a drug addict, you're probably not doing very good at your job, you're not doing very good with the wife or the husband or whoever your romantic partner happens to be, you're not really great with the kids. So that is going to increase the life likelihood in which you will think people are looking at you because they think you're ugly. Your belief system is going to be triggered. If you sleep really, really well and you exercise every day and you do all the things you need to do as far as step work and spirituality and you're doing good in every aspect of your life, when someone looks at you, it might not trigger a belief. 
and you might not react to it negatively and your day is going to go awesome. But when you're in active addiction, things aren't going so well. So we're really susceptible to our negative beliefs. Now, I'm not going to describe all these things to you guys, but there's some, one, there's some things here that are implicated in addiction very strongly and they're often discussed and for a good reason. And these things can inhibit or promote each other. Like we're talking another layer of complexity here. So when you're looking at your loved one and you're wondering like, is he doing this to me? Or is he doing this at me? Or is this person being addicted by choice? Are they a slave to their biological instincts? It's a very murky ground and each person should be treated individually. And that's kind of, I guess, the takeaway message from this is like, you can't say that one person is here or everyone's here or everyone's here or everyone's a combination of the two. People have different ratios of physical and psychological factors that all add up to them becoming an addict. Now, our symptoms are the same. We get loaded. That's what we do. But why we get loaded is different for a lot of people. So as far as like the disease model go, if we want to talk about the brain, we got glucocorticoids, right? Those are stress hormones. Cortisol is the most famous glucocorticoid. Now, if your mother, let's just say, had a really, really, really stressful life, especially when she was pregnant with you, what's going to happen is that she is going to be swapped with glucocorticoids. Now, when you're a fetus and you are living inside of your mother and you're basically learning and you're growing, you are making calculations and and that fetus is saying you know without using so many words my mom has lots of glucocorticoids in the bloodstream which means my mom is living in an unsafe environment so what i should do is i should raise my level of glucocorticoids so that when i'm born i am in a primed state i'm more sensitive to fear i'm more sensitive to negative emotion because that's what's going to keep me alive so if your mother has been stressed out throughout your pregnancy and you are born you are going to have permanently elevated levels of glucocorticoids for the rest of your life that's it game over that was too far not game over but you're not going to lower your level of glucocorticoids you are going to permanently be slightly or extremely more fearful than the average person okay and that's going to also mediate your susceptibility to your beliefs and your value system you will perceive your environment as more dangerous not because it's actually more dangerous but because you have higher levels of glucocorticoids um, your amygdala uh, amygdala is central to fear and aggression. It's an area of your brain. It's basically pulsing out, looking at things, asking itself, is this scary? Should I trigger a fear response? Should I trigger an aggression response to kill the threat? This type of thing. Now your amygdala can be enlarged through trauma. And the part of your amygdala that gets bigger when you experience trauma is actually the cell body, which receives neuronal projections. Now, I don't know if you guys know what that means, but in layman's terms, what it means is it's hypersensitive. So it'll look at something, squirrel, <laughs> and you'll be scared of a squirrel instead of only getting scared of big, big tigers or something like that. You're just going to be more sensitive to fear in general. Um, then obviously the prefrontal cortex, we should not ever talk about addiction and kind of brain function without mentioning the prefrontal cortex. Executive function, doing the right thing when it's the hard thing to do, impulse control, all these areas are, it's the, it's the person, yeah, it's the executive, it's the, it's the president, it's the prime minister. Now, here's the problem with the prefrontal cortex is that because it's so calorically expensive and it's so new and it's so complicated, what happens is it's the first place to be shut off when there's a significant emotional reaction. So if you're scared and your emotions go offside or you have an, uh, an event coming up that you're nervous for, what's going to happen? Or if you haven't been eating properly, sleeping properly, all these things, any risk factor you have will in limit the cortex's ability to do its job properly. And then you're going to fall back into your more reptilian animalistic style of thinking and you're not going to be making good decisions. And then, you know, we will most likely use drugs or drink booze as a result of the decision that we just made based on not really being that okay. And we're going to find it tough to live with that decision. Okay. So these are some of the areas that are implicated with the disease. Obviously we can talk about dopamine some other time. If you guys watch my step one overview video, I do a little spiel on dopamine that would be beneficial to you guys. Um, I don't know if you guys are wondering this. For me, I'm a little bit more on the moral side. My uh, addiction is more loaded in negative self-talk and insecurity about myself. 
um, and my abilities to be successful and like I don't think I'll ever find that special someone, I'm never gonna make that much money, that kind of negative self-talk I use as a cudgel to beat myself down and then I use heroin about it. Not so much anymore, obviously, not in the last four and a half years. Um, but I also do have some disease stuff going on and that meaning when I was young, I couldn't breathe for a period of time. Before I was very young, I, I, I don't remember any of this happening, but essentially I was dying for a fairly long time and because my throat was swelling up, I had surgery, but you know, and the problem was solved when I was fairly young, but that's trauma. That has lasting effects on the way that I perceive the world. Because at that age, your, your hormones don't modulate your behavior. They have an organizational effect, it's called. They're setting up my perceptual framework. So I'm probably more fearful than the average person. That adds to the negative self-talk, obviously. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. When we get to the moral model, it's, it, it's all these environmental factors. We got beliefs in there. We got your core beliefs. So again, so let's just have a, let's just say that my father was hypercritical and he always wanted to be right. And he was always the dad and I was always the son. And I always had so much to learn. And even though I'm a 31 year old man, he's still like that. Oh son, you're still not as good as your old man. And never validated me. He never gave me any kind of like encouragement when I was young. I'm going to either be hyper competitive or just feel like a failure all the time. So let's just say I develop a core belief, I will fail. A core belief is like an idea or a proposition that we act out. Um, now every time I oh, drop a pen, shit, I failed. And it'll actually cause significant emotional distress whenever I do that. If I uh, don't do as well as I could on a test, or I turn out to be a drug addict and I'm not living up to my potential, I'm gonna feel like I'm a failure, and it's gonna cause me to not wanna do anything at all. For me anyways, I just, I withdraw from my belief system. It's too much for me to think of stuff like that. So again, I use them as a cudgel to beat myself down and it, it makes me feel bad about myself, and then I escape with drugs and alcohol. Um, these can inhibit or promote each other. So. Here's the thing, prefrontal cortex will cause me to do the right thing even when, even though it's the harder thing to do. So, using drugs is easier than not using drugs. My prefrontal cortex should stop me from doing that. But like I said before, when we get into our belief system or perceptions or even uh, lessons that we've learned in the past, they will inhibit the cortex. if. I have a core belief that I'm going to fail and any kind of is stimulus in the environment, let's, you know, let's just say I'm playing basketball and I take a shot and I miss, you know, if I have a core belief that I'm going to fail, that's going to hit me very severely emotionally. And when I'm in a heightened emotional state, what that will do is it will inhibit the cortex. So now I'm not thinking properly and it can be just like that. If you guys are an addict, or an alcoholic out there, you know that it really does not take that much of a push to send us into a downhill spiral. I'm hypersensitive to my belief system and I will always use drugs when I am triggered in that way. It's my main problem. Now, also, based on past events, if I have trauma, I have a hyperactive amygdala, my hippocampus can actually be atrophied. Hippocampus, uh, I guess you could say it provides memories. So if my, hip, my, if my amygdala asks, is that scary? And my hippocampus has a memory of this being scary, it'll say, yes, it is scary. And then it'll trigger a fear response within me. So if I have trauma in my past and these areas of my brain are hypersensitive or they have a higher metabolic rate, or whatever, what's gonna happen is like my perceptions are gonna be filtered by fear. So even though maybe I have gone through some lessons learning that you know this stimulus in the environment is not associated with any kind of fear or negativity whatsoever, the fact that these are so sensitive will just cause me to experience a fear response anyways. I will get scared at things I should definitely not be scared of. So anyways, you guys, like the takeaway from this video is that like addiction is, is we don't know what it is. Sometimes it's more of a choice than others. Either way, both factors are at play. To say that someone is an addict by choice is extremely ignorant and it's just plain wrong. We don't choose to be addicts. We don't choose to feel like shit all the time about ourselves. We don't, like, I'm not like, I don't wake up in the morning and be like, hey, what can I do to fuck myself over and ensure that I will never be successful? And I do that. Uh, I don't have much control over that kind of stuff. Now, what I do have control over and what we can do is like through a process like the 12 steps, we can learn how to live again. We can learn to, 
to awareness around our negative core beliefs so that when we're triggered by them, we actually have some control over how badly they affect us or we're able to ignore them. Like I understand that you know, this guy saying this about me has triggered my core belief, but I know that that's not true. And at the end of the day, I can, I, I can choose to resist that impulse and I can learn to take care of myself. You know, if I'm eating well, if I'm sleeping well, if I'm drinking water, if, if I'm doing all that kind of stuff, I'm going to be way less susceptible to, to negative core beliefs. I'm going to be less susceptible to uh, my dopamine system, my prefrontal cortex will work efficiently to stop me from doing stupid things that cause me to screw my life up and the lives of the people that I love. Guys, at the end of the day, like is addiction a choice? Is it not a choice? Like we don't know. And I, and I hate to give you that answer, but it's true. We don't actually know. Some elements of it are a choice and some, ele uh, some elements of it are not a choice. Um, you can act in a better way and you can do therapy and you can bring your belief systems in check and you can lower or raise your expectations so you're not chronically um, um, unsatisfied or being threatened by events that happened in your life. And if you do that, it's going to be way less likely that you guys are going to shut off your prefrontal cortex or have your amygdala trigger a fear response. And Likewise, if you take care of your body, if you're sleeping properly, if you're drinking enough water, if you're exercising and doing all the, you know, besides the, the, the sense of accomplishment that you can get from helping that, it's just that when you're healthy, these won't be triggered as much. Your body's physical health will mediate your susceptibility to your belief system and your belief system can trigger your, the, the bad aspects of your biological functioning to go use drugs and stuff like that. So, I mean, the answer is both. Now, if you guys are more psychologically loaded, if you're here on the spectrum, I would recommend you focus a little bit more. I always recommend you, you treat your body with respect and you do the steps. But when you're here, of course, do the steps, but focus on your physical health and get, go to, you need to see a psychiatrist because they can prescribe you medication. You might even need antipsychotics. You might need antidepressants. You might need to try and bring these things into alignment artificially with medication so that then you can start attacking these things. And if you guys are more of a, of a moral model guy, I suggest a lot more therapy, a lot more, um, support groups and a lot more awareness. Talk about your issues, talk about your feelings. You need an intuitive awareness as to what exactly you think about the world that's causing you distress. So I hope I answered your guys' question. I, I didn't really actually answer anything. It's, it is both. To say that it's either one or the other is ignorant and it's thoughtless. So I recommend you stay away from any kind of hysterical, you know, imbalanced thinking on either either side and treat this problem more holistically. And each individual addict is going to be different as far as the motivations that go into his addiction. You guys, thanks a lot for stopping by. I hope this video was informative. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Send me awesome love messages on Facebook about how much you liked my videos. And I'll see you guys next time.